Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Several episodes ago, I put out a challenge, name your hometown and I will find a UFO encounter there. And wow, did you guys respond. I've received now, to date, over 150 locations from you guys. So thanks very much. This is going to be a lot of research, but I'm going to do my best. So today's episode is called UFOs in Your Hometown, Episode 2. This is going to be an ongoing series. I'm going to put these episodes out as I complete the research for each of these locations. And wow, there is a lot of UFO encounters. Again, this just goes to show you can spin the globe, put your finger down at random, and there is more than likely a UFO encounter that has occurred there. So the locations I'm covering today include Locust Grove, Oklahoma, McMinnville, Oregon, the entire country of India, Berkshire Mountains in Massachusetts, and Nova Scotia, Canada. Now, I'm still taking requests, but do keep in mind, with over 150 responses, it's going to take a while. And I would request that you don't name a, an entire country or more than one city. I'm only one guy here. I'm going to do what I can, but this takes a lot of research. But wow, did I find some amazing cases. Of course, not just sightings, but landings in humanoids, which to me are far more interesting, but onboard encounters as well. A whole variety of some really amazing encounters. Some are so unusual. I've tried to pick the cases that are the most extensive, the most credible, something that have something new to offer to our understanding of ET contacts. So this is by no means fully comprehensive, but certainly gives a sort of overview of UFO activity in any particular area. And what's also interesting is in this episode, you will see the full range of UFO evidence. We're talking landing trace cases, physiological effects, animal reactions, electromagnetic disturbances, some amazing photographic evidence, radar returns. People who say there's no evidence for UFOs have simply not done their homework. So yeah, I think you'll find this episode particularly interesting. I sure had a lot of fun researching it. Lots to cover here, so let's just get started with our first location. And the first location I'm covering, and I'm doing these in order, by the way, in order of location received. And the first location I'm covering today is Locust Grove, Oklahoma. This is by special request of Making D. So this is for you, Making D. And I have to tell you, I didn't have a whole lot of luck finding UFOs in this location. Turns out this is a very small town. But I did find something, and I think you'll find it pretty compelling. This case is from MUFON and apparently uninvestigated. But per the report, a man heard his dogs barking. He went outside, and this is when he saw unexplained lights rising up from behind a bush just about 30 feet away. They came towards him, and then towards his dog, and he said that some are like balls of plasma and seem to throw off sparks, while others appeared to spin and change shape. And he actually took some video of them. He does say that his dog reacted to them, didn't like them, and was apparently able to sense them when they weren't even visible, and can also smell where they have been previously. It's an odd report, but certainly interesting. So there you go, not a whole lot, but I tried, and there certainly was one case. But now let's move to the next one, which is McMinnville, Oregon, and this is by request of Happy Girl. And Happy Girl, you'll be happy to know I found some amazing cases. In fact, McMinnville has given the entire world some really outstanding contributions to UFO history. In fact, it's got one of the most famous and well-verified photographic cases ever. But like in all these locations that I'm presenting tonight, except one, there are humanoids as well. Some really interesting sightings and landings and so forth. So let's just get started with McMinnville, Oregon. There was no way that Evelyn and Paul Trent could have predicted that on May 11, 1950, 
something would happen that would make them world famous and would put the little town of McMinnville, Oregon on the UFO map forever. It was a hazy evening around 7.45 p.m. They were both in the backyard of their home, which is just southwest of McMinnville. Evelyn was feeding the rabbits, and this is when a UFO appeared. As Evelyn says, we both saw the object at the same time. They described it as a metallic saucer, about 30 feet wide, and only about 1,500 feet away from them, and 50 feet up in the sky, so quite close. Now, Evelyn had seen UFOs a few times before, and was disappointed because nobody believed her when she talked about it. Her husband, Paul, didn't really believe in UFOs at all. But now that one was right in front of their eyes, they both immediately thought of the Kodak camera that they had already loaded with film. As Evelyn says, Paul thought it was in the car, but I was sure it was in the house. I was right. Paul took the first picture. The object was coming in towards us and seemed to be tipped up a little bit. It was very bright, almost silvery, and there was no noise or smoke. So after taking the first picture, Paul quickly rewound the camera, and about 30 seconds later, as the object began to gather speed and turn to the northwest, he snapped a second picture. And as Paul says, there wasn't any flame, and it was moving fairly slow. Then I snapped the first picture. It moved a little to the left, and I moved to the right to take another picture. Then it seemed to pick up speed and vanished. I was kind of scared, you know? You hear so much talk about these things and the government. Now, after this happened, Evelyn tried to phone her in-laws, who lived just down the road, but was unable to reach them. They really weren't sure what they had photographed, and afterwards just kind of went on with life as normal. One month later, in June, they developed the pictures and were delighted to see that they had in fact captured two very clear images of this apparent craft. And at first, they shared these photographs only among the family, until their niece, who was in the army, saw the photos and urged them to tell somebody. So Paul decided to tell his banker, who was very impressed by Paul's honesty and the photos, and actually hung them up in the bank window. And this is what caught the attention of a reporter from the local newspaper, who actually requested the negatives and published them as a front page news story. And the result was like setting off an atomic bomb. The newspaper began receiving calls, hundreds of them. In fact, Life magazine contacted them and published the photos in the June 1950 issue. Now, at one point, the newspaper was receiving about a thousand letters per day, mostly from people requesting copies of these photographs. Others, of course, said that they had seen similar objects and wanted to share their own stories. But the newspaper eventually printed more than 6,200 copies of these photos. And even two weeks later, they were receiving 50 requests every day. Now, per researcher Frank Edwards, the Air Force folks at the Pentagon said that these photographs were the best civilian photographs that they had seen up to that time. Now, Paul was amazed by everyone's interest in his photos. He was very reluctant at first to come forward, as he says. I didn't believe all that talk about flying saucers before. But now I have an idea, idea the Army knows what they are. Of course, no surprise, reporters besieged the Trents, and they did many interviews. Investigators, of course, came to study the photos, and while some tried to debunk the photos, experts such as Bruce Maccabee and many others declared them genuine, and no evidence of fakery was ever found. Ultimately, after being besieged by reporters for so long, Paul Trent refused to talk any more about it. In fact, the ridicule took a toll on the whole family. As his daughter Tammy said, We were the alien family. That's all that was talked about was the alien family. But even as late as 2008, there continued to be controversy when the Trent's relatives tried to get the negatives back from the newspaper. Turned out the newspaper didn't have them. Turned out that Bruce Maccabee had them and had been holding them for about 25 years. 
He returned them to the news register who had first given them to him, and the news register did not want to give them back to the family. Now, Bruce Maccabee wrote that the Trent family had rightful ownership, but the newspaper said that they, these negatives should be part of a, quote, permanent display in Yamhill County. Now, the Trents don't have the money to sue for rights to these photos, these negatives. And this is apparently where this case currently stands. But in any case, the McMinnville photographs are now considered by most researchers to be among the best UFO photographs in history. And here I just want to play a little four minute long audio clip of Evelyn Trent describing this amazing sighting and the photographs that they took. I had to look up and I seen this thing and, and I ran into the house to tell him about it. He went one look after a camera and I went the other way after a camera and between the both of us we found it. The best thing I could say would be just about the size of a parachute without any wings or anything like that. It was all flat on the bottom and it was still recolored. I was about the only thing about that there was no smoke, no noise either once. It was just above the electric light wires a ways. I just, you know, the distance and stuff, I just don't know. It, it could have hovered for a while, you know, just like that. And he took the picture, and right just as soon as he took the picture, he ran the film to re you know, to take another one. And as soon as he took it, it turned and just took off very fast. The next McMinnville case I'd like to talk about occurred on November 5, 1957, and this was actually during a massive UFO wave which was sweeping across the United States. Sam Kelchner saw this strange craft hovering over his home just south of McMinnville. He said it was egg-shaped, glowed orange, and was hovering over his poultry farm, real close, no more than 1,000 feet away while he and his family were able to view it through binoculars. It remained for a full 30 minutes as it moved a few times, hovered, and then finally took off across the sky. He did call the police, who told him that they had in fact received many calls from people in the surrounding areas. Another report comes from John Orr, who said that the following day he was walking near the Amity High School in Amity, located just south of McMinnville, when he saw a UFO. Another case occurred on December 28, 1976, when the National UFO Reporting Service, New Fork, actually received a call about a McMinnville sighting. And I'd like to play a nine minute long audio clip, which is quite interesting regarding this sighting. Yes, sir. I'm calling from the news register in McMinnville, Oregon. Yes. Uh, to see if there's any kind of UFO sighting report out of this area from last night. No, sir. None whatsoever. In fact, we didn't even have a call last night. Okay. There were. We had we had one in here, which was a uh, involved with someone classified as a UFO because there's, it was a soundless two soundless lights, which were followed by uh, 45 minutes to an hour and a half of military jet aircraft. I see. Circling and maneuvering and uh, and uh, the other, the object apparently taking evasive action uh, uh, for about a 45 minute period and then another 45 minutes of, of just military jet aircraft uh, flying over and circling. Very interesting. Do you have the party's name to call it in? Yes, I do. We were completely fogged in in this area. He, the only reason that he saw us, it was well outside of town, eight miles out, clear up in the the uh, boondoggles. I see. And he, uh, he where, where he lives, and he was he was up above the fog. Uh, there's a you know, he's a good source and was uh, was in control of his faculties. At the time, I've been unable to locate any, uh, I was going to call McCord, but there were no jet aircraft out of Portland last uh -huh. night. They were fogged in. Um, so I've been unable to locate any source of the, of the four military jet aircraft, which he said were up there for an hour and a half last night. Okay. Well, we'll see if we can come up with some information. If we do, well, we'll get back to you. Okay. Who am uh, I talking to? Uh, my name is Jeb Ladine. So if, uh, yeah, if you, uh, anything might come on, I think I'll probably still make a call to, or would you normally make calls to the, the, uh, 
uh, McCord and Whitby and so forth on something like this? To check on aircraft? Check on aircraft. We probably would, yes. Well, I might just wait and, and contact you again. What is your name? Uh, Robert Gribble, G-R-I-B-B-L-E. Okay. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll, if I don't hear back from you, I'll give a call back this afternoon. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye. Go for reporting center. Yes, could I speak to Mr. Gibble, please? This is he. Yeah, this is Bill. You called earlier? Yes, sir. Uh, we're interested in uh, the objects that you saw in the sky the other night. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could get a description of that. Um, we were fairly high altitude, so basically all it was is just a, um, a very, very bright light and more of a um, circular you know, shape to it. Um, seemed like when I saw it cross, I could see a little bit of a, a light, whether it might just have been a light, you know, from trailing from the speed it was traveling at. It looked like there was a smaller light towards the back of it. Uh -huh. But it was, it was at a fairly high altitude, and it was a very bright light. It looked like a, almost like a, you know, like a, a landing light or something, it, you know, when you're at a close distance to it. So, uh, it was that, it was that bright. So. But it would um, be very difficult to estimate, you know, like how high it was or anything. Because yeah. it was so, it was so bright. But I did see aircraft in, in, you know, like jet aircraft in the area at the time. And I could make out, uh, I don't know how close they were to it, but I could make out all the running lights on the aircraft. Like I say, I can't really judge how large it was or, you know, or how high it was just because... I didn't know how big it was in first right. place, so. Yeah. But what time did you spot that? Uh, just almost exactly 8 o'clock. That was Monday night? Mm -hmm. Okay. And was the object on the move? Yes, definitely. It was circling. It kept doing a, um, it was coming from northwest and circling and, and circling. It was, I first saw it coming out of the northwest, but it was doing a definite circle pattern. As it was moving? Mm -hmm. At a very uh -huh. high rate of speed. Uh -huh. um, it made four passes on just, as near as I could tell, the exact same course. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't seem to vary at all, but it was going out at quite a distance to the east, to the northeast, and then coming back through. Um, I could not hear any sound from it. That after I first saw it, then I, the aircraft came in, you know, I, then I saw them. I don't know if it was there before or not, you know, I don't know how long it had been up there, yes. because I just noticed that, you know, by coincidence, I happened to go upstairs and look out the window and see it, so I don't know how long it, you know, that it was visible, uh, but after I did see it the first time, then I could start to see uh, the aircraft, which seemed to be like they were pursuing it or at least shadowing it, and then I could start to hear the jet engines from them, but when I first saw it, there were no aircraft in the area, you know. My first sighting of it was just, you know, 30 seconds or a minute, uh, but I could not hear any sound from it. After a point, then there were a number of aircraft in the area, and I could hear them, so I don't know, you know, uh, they were making so much noise, I couldn't tell whether it was making any noise or not. Right. Did the object itself seem to be evading the aircraft? Uh, it seemed to be sticking to uh, pretty much of a course. Um, it did seem like that it would, you know, that it would accelerate and go away from them. I would, what I saw in my first, my first reaction when I saw it was that, that it did try to move away from them and that they were definitely in pursuit of it. I see. Um, our checking around yesterday said everybody's saying, claiming that there were no military aircraft up that night, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> uh huh. Did the object maintain the same color at all times? Yes, it did. It was just a, a brilliant light, brilliant white light. Uh -huh. Did you see it until it moved away? Yes, it it went out, did its circle pattern, went off towards the east, like almost due east, right towards Mount Hood, uh -huh. and then that was the last. That was the last I saw of it. Okay. The aircraft came back, and after I'd lost sight of of the the object, the aircraft continued to go back and forth in a, you know, and what looked like a, they were patrolling the search area. Pattern like, you know, like a search pattern or something. Uh -huh. 
just uh, they were the aircraft seemed to be doing like a, a crisscross thing for at one point. That uh, I lost sight of it at about 8:30 or 8:45. I finally completely lost sight of the object, and then all from then on, all I saw was the aircraft. Uh -huh. Okay, but how long did you watch that? I watched. Uh, from 8 to 8.45 I saw the, the object but then I, I stayed and watched for you know until well after 9 o'clock and uh -huh. continued to watch the airplane uh, and then everything quieted down but at one point there were I counted what I I thought there were a lot of stars out that night I live up to fairly high elevation it was, you know, it was quite foggy but it was extremely clear and there were a lot of stars out uh, but at one point it looked like a light show going on so yes with so many aircraft going, but I counted what I, I think was four jets at one time. So. Do you have an 800 number there by any chance? No, we don't, unfortunately. I was thinking that somebody around did have, but I think there's one in, in the southwest. That has yeah, there's one in Illinois, but it's confined to police use only. Hmm. It's not available to the public. We're the only public center of its kind in the country. Hmm. Yeah, this is the first time I'd ever seen it like that. I've never um, flown a lot. <laughs> uh -huh. and that's the first time I'd ever seen it. And I, I don't think it would even have interested me. I would have passed it off as a, a meteor or something if I had not seen the aircraft, which were, I felt to be in pursuit of it. So. Okay, now, was this object, you saw it come out of the northwest, it was maintaining this circular pattern as it was moving through the sky? I mean, was it circling as it was moving, or did it just maintain a constant... It maintained a pretty much of a constant uh -huh. pattern. Yeah. Um, I first thought well, it was very, very foggy that night. I thought that somebody was, you know, was trying to find a place to put down or something. Right. And uh, there's a fairly good sized airport here in McMinnville. And that was my first thought. And then when I saw the other aircraft moving around it, and I started to start to get my interest up a little bit. Right. Um, they definitely stayed around for a while. Okay, well, we sure appreciate this information, and if we come up with anything regarding the object's identification, we'll get back to you and let you know. Okay, if I happen to... Is this a... Um, is your number a 24-hour number? Yes, it is. Okay, if I happen to um, to check it again, then I will alert you then. Very good, thank you. Mm, thank you. Bye. Here's another very interesting case which occurred on the morning of December 13, 1991. Susan Wald glanced out the south-facing window of her McMinnville home when she noticed a strange object, quote, way, way up and far, far away. Now, it was still a little dark out. This was very early in the morning. So she got her glasses and watched this object for about 45 minutes. She said it looked almost rectangular, but was filled with many brilliant lights. And finally, around 8 a.m., when it was getting light, this object disappeared but she is convinced she saw something unexplained. First, she told only a friend, but later called the newspaper. And as she says, I wasn't dreaming. I don't know if I believe in flying saucers, but I know I saw one. Now here is another case from New Fork, which occurred on Independence Day, July 4th, 1997. Lots of UFO sightings on July 4th. At any rate, the witness was standing outside his McMinnville home using binoculars to watch a nearby fireworks display when he saw a disc-shaped object with red-orange lights hovering in place in the sky. Suddenly it was gone, and he noticed that it had in fact shot upwards and was now hovering in a different location over a field. It's very interesting because there are so many reports of UFOs being seen during fireworks shows. Now, I did find one humanoid case, which is quite brief. It comes from researcher George Feiler, who writes that on February 2nd, 1999, a group of campers were sitting around a campfire at an isolated ranch outside of McMinnville when they heard noises in the surrounding brush. Going to investigate, they did find, quote, weird footprints. So they followed them where they led into a meadow and it was at this point that they saw a huge, bizarre creature walking through the meadow at a fast pace. It was dark. They shone a flashlight at it, and it ran away. 
But here's the interesting UFO connection because later that night they did see an unidentified bright light shoot over the area at high speed. Here's a more recent case. It occurred around 9.45 on the evening of April 17, 2002 as a nine-year-old boy looked out the window of his McMinnville home and saw a glowing oval-shaped object moving slowly. It went right past his window then suddenly accelerated off into the distance. Then, three seconds later, he saw a triangular object appear in nearly the same place and suddenly dart away. A final McMinnville case occurred one month later. This was from New Fork, but was investigated by researcher Eric Byler. And this involves a mother and her child who around midnight on May 7, 2002, heard a strange sound that they couldn't identify or locate the source of. Finally, the mother looked out the dining room window, and this is when she saw a saucer-shaped craft with colored lights around it. And this object was hovering and spinning in place above some trees besides this house. Then, this object appeared to descend behind the trees, and it was gone. So there you go. That's McMinnville, Oregon. I hope you found that interesting, Happy Girl. That's for you. But wow, it sure was interesting in terms of Paul and Evelyn Trent's photograph of a UFO. One of the most famous and best verified photographic cases in UFO history. Did not know the whole story. Really interesting. Some other really compelling cases there in McMinnville. So thanks very much, Happy Girl. I learn something new each time I do research for these episodes. That's certainly true with McMinnville. And now we move to our next location, and this is by special request of Anus Tapdata. And thanks so much, Anus Tapdata, for giving me an entire country to cover, which is India, and that happens to be a lot of people there. So. By no means am I covering this entire country. What I have done is focused solely on humanoid cases, some really interesting humanoid cases. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about in terms of encounters in India. It was just too much. You could easily write a multi-volume set of books on encounters in India. So please forgive me for limiting myself to humanoid encounters, but again, I think these are the most interesting, and I certainly hope you guys find it interesting as well. Again, India is a pretty big country with an enormous population, so it should come as no surprise there are, there are quite a few humanoid cases, and they go way back. In fact, the earliest one I could find occurred one morning in March of 1931. A 14-year-old boy was tending cattle in the mountains of the Andhra Pradesh area of India. And this is when he saw a figure who he believed to be a, quote, sage, meditating under a tree. So he walks up to this guy and asks him where he came from. And this man said, from the distant stars. And at this point, he actually led the boy to a disc-shaped craft landed some distance away in the mountains and invited the boy inside. And inside this craft, this boy said he saw other, quote, wise men inside. He was told to sit in a golden chair. He was given fruit to eat. He was shown all these beautiful rooms with mirror-like screens, which actually showed images of himself in his home village and other strange images, which he perceived to be various Hindu gods. He was told that these screen-like Im images, these instruments, would soon be publicly available to everyone. So this could be an apparent prediction of TVs, which at that point had not yet been made publicly available. But this boy says he was then shown images of worldwide disasters of earthquakes, volcanoes, and tsunamis, and was told that these would in fact occur in our future. So this has all the elements we see in modern-day onboard experiences. Now here's another case which occurred in 1954. This was a big year for humanoids in this area. And this case from Dennis Brace involves a disc-shaped object that reportedly landed in a field near Madras, India. No exact date is provided, but according to the report, 
human-looking occupants came out and spoke with the woman and other people in the neighborhood and then returned to their craft, which took off. The report with an exact date occurred on September 15, 1954, when about 800 villagers in the Man Boom Bihar area said that they saw a 12-foot-wide gray saucer hovering about 500 feet over a mine which actually supplied beryllium for the Atomic Energy Commission. So that's an interesting detail. And it was just a few months later, on November 2nd, 1954, that residents of Calcutta saw a, quote, brightly illuminated object with human forms on board moving from east to west. One lady from Dubri said that she saw a saucer land in a field and then quickly take off, and it frightened her so badly that she fainted. It was later that same month, on November 27, that about 100 people said that they saw a, quote, boat flying. It had a bright light on one end and actually landed in this field. Three people emerged, stayed for about five minutes, re-entered the object, which took off at high speed. So, quite a few cases. Here's one from Janet and Colin Board, which took place on July 1st, 1976, in Madras. And in this case, a woman reported her encounter with an eight-foot-tall humanoid with shiny skin, which she said emerged from the forest, then returned back into the woods, and moments later she saw a large, yellow-red, cigar-shaped object rise up from the woods and dart off into the distance. Now, here's a really interesting and extensive case from India. This account comes from Prashant Solomon and involves a family, Lalit Chawla, his wife Nina, and their two sons. They were walking near their home in Bombay one evening in the summer of 1957, and a UFO hovered overhead and struck them with a beam of light. Following this, the husband Lalit became very pensive and quiet in the days that followed. But later that night, he was driving to Juhu Beach when this UFO reappeared, hovered over his car, and sent down a beam of yellow light. And it was one night sometime later that the family was hosting a birthday party when one of the girls at the party cried out that she saw a, quote, blue man with four arms standing in the doorway. Now later, the girl's mother wondered about this and realized that this sounded very much like the Hindu god Vishnu. So that's certainly strange to say the least. But it was that night that Nina Chala woke up to see her bedroom filled with light and what appeared to be various Hindu gods, such as Vishnu, Ganesh, and others. And not only that, she saw her husband levitating in the air next to her. Now, this being that looked like Vishnu began to speak telepathically to her, telling her not to be afraid, that their work here was over, and that they would be leaving in peace. At which point, her husband Lalit floated back into bed, and the light and the beings vanished. Certainly an odd case. And here's another one. In June of 1985, a 17-year-old girl from Bihar was found by a local farmer with apparent glowing patches on her body. Uh, she was disoriented and rushed to a hospital where they diagnosed her with radiation burns. And according to her own testimony, she said she had been walking in a field when a silver disc appeared overhead, sent down a beam of light, and pulled her inside. Inside this craft, she saw dwarf-sized beings which approached her and said no harm would come to her. They proceeded to place her in a glass booth, which she said seemed to scan her, and that's all she remembered. Now, there are also some pretty recent encounters. As reported to New Fork, on February 28, 2001, a group of boys from Ahmedabad were bicycling to Temple when they said that they saw two short, pale figures with kind of onion-shaped heads and large black eyes. After these figures left, they found small footprints in the area. And whether or not this is related is hard to say for sure, but one of the boys became quite ill after the encounter and had to be hospitalized. 
Interestingly, later, a fruit seller said that he also saw several similar beings in a field in this same area around the same time. Here's a very interesting case, which was reported on by Whitley Strieber. It occurred in the Indian Himalayas. This was on September 27, 2004, when a group of scientists, and you can actually see them here, this case got quite a bit of publicity, were hiking at 17,000 feet elevation when they saw a huge white spherical object hovering overhead. They ran over to see what it was, at which point it disappeared, but it was during this time that they were confronted by a humanoid figure. They said it was four feet tall, almost robotic looking with a kind of cylindrical head, and it began to glide towards them, then levitate up and into this spherical object, which promptly darted away. What's interesting about this case is they were able to snap a photograph of this entity, which you can see here. It's not a great photograph, but it's certainly interesting given that these witnesses are scientists. And this case did get a lot of attention. It was investigated by the Indian Space Research Organization, as well as the Indian Army, who were quite impressed with the case and took it very seriously. Here's another even more recent case, which occurred on October 1st, 2015, when farm workers from the village of Kanagal saw a red UFO drop from the sky and actually land. Very quickly, a humanoid figure emerged and came briefly towards the witnesses, then returned to the craft, which took off. It was then discovered that some other villagers also saw a craft drop down to about 500 feet, and they said that they were able to see humanoid figures inside of it. Well, how's that? I mean, some of these cases are definitely unique outliers, not your average humanoid encounter by any means, but super fascinating. And it's been going on for a long time. That's no surprise. ETs have been here forever. <laughs> I'm sure there are far more encounters with just humanoids than I covered here but it certainly gives a good sort of cross-section of what's going on with humanoids in India. And now we move to our next location, which is by a special request of Zor Nuuk. And Zor Nuuk, you asked me to cover the Berkshire Mountains of Massachusetts. Turns out this is a fairly large area, including several cities. So again, I'm going to request you guys to please limit yourself to one city. It makes my job a lot easier. But I did my best. Uh, it was hard because I couldn't cover each of the cities in this location. So this, again, is by no means comprehensive. But I did find some very interesting cases, including a couple of onboard encounters. That's mostly what I focused on here. A few super interesting sightings. Of course, the very famous Tom Reed encounter, which I suspect is our nuke, is what you wanted me to cover. Can't say for sure, but I found another very interesting onboard case involving a famous celebrity. So hopefully you will find that fascinating as well. Again, the Berkshire Mountains is a pretty large area containing many cities, so it's difficult to investigate this one but I did find some interesting incidents. One occurred in 1954 and it involves the provocative and controversial talk show host Morton Downey Jr. who has since passed away. But he was hypnotized live on his show by UFO researcher Gene Mundy to recall an episode of Missing Time. At the time he was 20 years old and was driving through the Berkshire Mountains when he saw a brilliant light. His car stalled, he felt a sense of electricity, then he blacked out, and he woke up shortly later with a dreamlike memory of seeing this beautiful yellow light, seeing really beautiful faces, being laid out on a table. That's all he could really recall, other than he was now missing about 40 minutes of time. Then, live on the show, he went under hypnosis. And I will just quote Morton directly. This is his testimony retrieved under hypnosis. As he says, I was removed to the stage and hypnotized. This is under hypnosis now. In 1954, I was driving on Boston Post Road. I was a young kid. I had to get to Boston for a convention. It was late at night. I'd been driving 
two and a half hours. I'm outside of Hartford, Connecticut. We don't have big roads. We just have this two-lane Boston Post Road. It opens up to a three-lane road. And I'm driving along, and there is a star to my right. And it's always right outside the window of my car. 40, 50 miles with this star. Must be an airplane. But this one is moving with me. I'm driving past an electric power plant, and I'm still driving. I've gone zigzagged, and the star is now in front of me, moving away and out of my distant sight. There's an overpass. I see this fog coming down over this overpass. It must be a fog patch. It's right over the bridge. I hit the fog. My lights are going down. My car is stopping by itself. I turn over to the side so I can get off the road. I'm in the dark, except for this gray, pulsating light. You have nothing to fear. I better get out of my car. I can't open the door or window or vent. The car won't start. A voice keeps saying, you have nothing to fear. Hair on my hands and head is standing up. It's got to be from the power plant. But why? All of a sudden, my whole vehicle is being picked up off the road. I don't feel any motion. I'm just being lifted off the road. I don't see any faces. I don't feel any touch. I keep hearing a voice. You have nothing to fear. Tremendous pain over my chest. Am I dying? Am I having a heart attack? You have nothing to fear. I'm seeing fog. I don't know how long it is, but I have the feeling that the car is being gently replaced on the road. I see the pavement and the swirling as the fog as it starts to pick up. Automatically, my car starts to go on. My window rolls on. I look at my watch. It's now 10 minutes to 2. I leave and I drive further up the road. I'm tired. I'm probably hallucinating. When I check into the cabin, I have to wake the manager and the cabin. His watch says one time. My watch says 43 minutes less. So that's what he recalled under hypnosis. It's interesting because a disclaimer appeared during this episode that says, and I quote, Mort does not really believe he was on a UFO. So he's backpedaling a little bit there, but this certainly does sound like an onboard UFO encounter. Now the next case is the very famous Tom Reed case, which has been covered extensively. I would certainly refer people to check out Tom Reed directly because he is quite active in this field. But I'll cover it briefly because it's an amazing case. It occurred one evening, well, there's actually several incidents. One evening in September 1966, Tom, who was then six years old, and his three-year-old brother Matthew saw this weird light outside the window of their bedroom from their home in the Berkshire Hills. Suddenly, without any idea how they got there, they found themselves outside. Uh, in fact, their mother said that they looked almost entranced. It was one year later, in September 1967, it happened again. Both Tom and his brother went missing, while their mother Nancy frantically searched for them. But events came to a dramatic climax on September 1st, 1967, when Nancy, her mother Marion, and the two boys were driving along Highway 7 near a covered bridge. You can see it here. And suddenly this gigantic glowing craft appeared overhead, very close, about 600 feet away. All four of them felt strangely immobilized as an unnatural silence enveloped them. Suddenly the crickets began chirping, the UFO was gone, and everything was back to normal, except that Nancy was in the wrong seat, Marion was standing outside the car on the road, Tom was left with vague memories of being in a large, dark room, laying on a table, seeing five-foot-tall humanoids with an insect-like appearance, hearing other family members in there crying out. Now, as Tom says, Now, we do remember being in what looked like an airplane hangar. We didn't stay in the car. We were removed from the vehicle. That's true. Where we were, I don't know. So he's very careful in his interpretation of this. But... As it turned out, numerous people in the area were reporting UFOs at this same time. In fact, the local radio station was flooded with calls from people seeing UFOs. And this, no surprise, became the talk of the town. 
and when Tom Reed's family story came out. Despite the corroboration from the many other witnesses in this area, they were endlessly ridiculed, to the point finally where they actually sold their home and their business and moved away. But since then, Tom Reed has continued to investigate and talk about his encounter. He did take and pass a polygraph test. Tom's story has appeared on various television programs, but was to his dismay somewhat sensationalized and distorted. Uh, he has worked hard to get the word out about this, and in fact there is now a UFO monument, this is the first of its kind, commemorating the event. And he is actually writing a book to get the truth of what happened on record. He refers to his encounter simply as, quote, an off-world incident. Now there are other cases in this area. There was an article by Derek Gentili in the newspaper which writes that on May 5, 1988, Richard Wells was walking along Pleasant Street in the city of Lee in the Berkshire Mountains. This was around 8.30 p.m. when he saw a bright light flashing green, blue, and red. He thought at first it might be a plane, but it wasn't moving. And in fact, it remained in view for about 45 minutes. He saw it again the next night and was unable to identify it and actually snapped a photograph. And this is what prompted him to call the Pittsfield Airport, local radio stations and newspapers, and eventually reported it to a UFO center. It turns out he wasn't the only witness, because a few days earlier, Police Chief Michael Balcom so the third station received a call from a woman who lived in the North Egremont area, and she said that she saw a UFO hovering over Boyce Road. Now, upon investigation, Officer Balcom and another man did discover three equidistant patches of singed vegetation off to the side of the road, apparent landing traces. And another sighting from 1973 comes from Harold I. Munson, who said that he was driving along Route 7 in Stockbridge, this was one evening in around 9 p.m., when he noticed a light pacing his car. And he's, he says, it kept coming closer and closer. Then it took off at super high speed in a couple of seconds. He said it looked like, quote, two dinner plates put together. And as he says, I'm a believer. So there you go, that's the Berkshire Mountains. The Tom Reed case is amazing. He's still very active on the UFO circuit. He's glad he's putting out a book. I'll be first in line to read that one because, wow, what an amazing series of events. And who knew that the Morton Downey Jr., the talk show host, apparently had an onboard encounter, even though he backpedaled a little bit once he realized what he was saying. It certainly is interesting. But now we move to the next location. I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the intro, but this is one of the locations I am covering today, Sacramento, California. That's by special request of Danny. This is a huge city, capital of California, a half million people. So again, by no means comprehensive, but I found some super interesting encounters. One that's incredibly bizarre. I mean, wow. This. One case alone is worth the price of admission. I've never heard anything like it, but it appears to be legitimate, but certainly unusual. Humanoid cases as well, landings, the whole deal. UFOs are seen everywhere. I'll say it again because it's true. Sacramento's most famous sighting by far is part of the very famous and controversial airship wave of the late 1890s. So it was almost 130 years ago, on November 17, 1896, when crowds of people in Sacramento saw a strange airship moving over the city. Some people reported hearing voices. Others said that they actually did see people. The object does resemble today's blimps and zeppelins. And in fact, zeppelins would be officially invented just a few years later. This is an event that has been widely covered, so I'm not going to go in-depth into it. Uh, but I do wonder about this wave of sightings. Perhaps these were, in fact, blimps that had not been revealed yet. Hard to say for sure, but it's certainly an odd event. 
But activity really began in 1947. And in fact, it was the summer of 1947 that an unprecedented superwave of UFO activity swept across the United States and the world. And two cases from Sacramento occurred right around the same time as the Roswell UFO crash in July. At 8 a.m. on July 5, Dr. A.K. Carr and his wife observed two glowing disks trailing each other at about 8 to 10,000 feet altitude over Sacramento. It was four days later, at 1.45 p.m. on July 9th, that Savita Rosetta and her son Dempsey and several other neighborhood children spent about 20 minutes watching a shiny disc-shaped object perform amazing maneuvers overhead. That was an amazing UFO wave. And since then, UFO activity has been occurring regularly. The next Sacramento case I found occurred on April 9, 1950. An amateur astronomer, Mr. H. Banach, was scanning the night sky at around 8.35 p.m. with a small telescope when he says he saw, get this, a massive fleet of 50 five zero white objects, all glowing white, he called out his friends and they all took turns watching these objects and after they left they called the Sacramento Bee to report their amazing sighting. A couple of years later this is an amazing event. This is a multiple witness case which occurred on June 4, 1952 when a lady by the name of Zelma H. Meek was in her Sacramento home and saw a group of children outside gazing upward. Going outside, she saw an orange-yellow, glowing, sort of comma-shaped object hovering stationary in the sky. It then descended, turned sharply, changed directions, and seemed to change shape as it accelerated off into the distance. Now, it turns out Zelma was a supervisor at the Sacramento Air Defense Filter Center, but she did not report the sighting out of fear of ridicule. She says that while at her job, she received many reports of UFOs, and she and the others who worked there felt that there was little reason to report UFOs as no news was ever forthcoming from their superiors about these reports that were consistently coming in. And one month later, on July 29, there was another report, which was in fact talked about by the Air Defense Filter Center who at this time said that they were, in fact, receiving about three reports of UFOs per day. This particular sighting was made by a 16-year-old boy by the name of Jerry Spear, who said that he saw two objects at very low elevation. He said they were 20 feet tall, about 40 feet long. These were solid objects, each with three sets of two windows, and they were darting up and down and sideways in this non-conventional way. And as Jerry says in his own words, the thing looked like two flattened tops that had been flattened out against each other. The windows were square and the frames stuck out. The whole thing was covered with shiny metal. So your typical UFO. And another witness was Miles M. Myers of 2425 Meadowbrook Road, who said that on that same night, an object hovered directly over his house and then went straight up. Very interesting. And the sightings continued. On August 2nd, 1955, a Sacramento resident reports his sighting of a, quote, flat and amber-colored egg-shaped object, which he said was performing strange maneuvers. Now, he reported to the military who wrote, and I quote, came up in south, went to southwest, made a 90-degree turn, came straight ahead, and climbed straight out of sight. Now, it's funny because Blue Book, quote, investigated this sighting, and they actually altered the details to make this report look like it was a plane, and they declared it identified. That's Project Blue Book for you. Here's another case. Two years later, November 6, 1957, 2.30 a.m., truck driver Stanford M. Carter was driving into Sacramento when he saw a brilliant blue light over North Sacramento. He thought for a brief moment it might be a shooting star, but it actually hovered in place. 
and as he says, it's different from everything I've ever seen. Meanwhile, other witnesses were reporting seeing UFOs described as, quote, egg-shaped, bluish-green, and bright and solid. Here's a very interesting case, a typical close encounter of the second kind, which comes from the Saucerian Bulletin. It was three days, actually, after the above case, on November 9, 1957, about 15 minutes after midnight, a man was driving in Sacramento when his car, engine, and headlights failed. Looking up, this is when he saw an egg-shaped object about 150 to 200 feet long, maybe 40 to 50 feet wide, with very sort of short delta-shaped wings. It was moving over his car. He said it glowed bright blue and left a sort of fluorescent trail behind it. At the time, there was a massive wave of encounters sweeping across the country. In fact, that week still remains one of the busiest in United States UFO history. Now, this next case is a doozy. It is so strange. This has to be one of the strangest UFO encounters on record. And it occurred to a 13-year-old paper boy by the name of Philip Wayne. It was 5.30 a.m. on July 11, 1961, and Philip was delivering a stack of the Sacramento Union newspapers to residents along the 3400 Evergreen Circle block of Meadow, Meadowdale, this is a neighborhood in Sacramento, and I'll just let Philip describe in his own words what happened. This is what he told reporters and military officers. As he says, I reached my hand over my head to throw a folded newspaper, and suddenly there was no paper in my hand. I thought I had missed and reached for a second paper. The same thing happened. When the third paper was jerked from my hand, I felt a suction but heard no noise. I looked up and saw two things that looked like flying saucers. One was larger than the other, but were about 80 to 100 feet above the ground. And those newspapers were soaring straight up to those saucers. The larger saucer was 50 feet across and the smaller one was 40 feet across. They were shiny aluminum and seemed to be standing still. Now, Philip said that he could see what looked like weird pipes of different lengths sticking out from it. Didn't get a good look at it because, as he says, I took off like a scared bird. Uh, he did return to the area, as he says. Later, I went back, checking for the missing papers. I counted my stack three times. Three were missing. I never found them. So, yeah, he reported his experience to Air Force officials, who apparently took it seriously and told him that they would investigate. Needless to say, Philip did not hear back from them. This next case from 1964 was reported to MUFON and is one of the few humanoid accounts I could find from Sacramento. The witness was waiting for his father, who worked at McClellan Air Force Base, when he saw an 18-foot-wide eight-foot-high disc-shaped craft land in a field. This field was filled with cows and was located towards the north end of McClellan Air Force Base. This was nighttime, but the craft was so bright it lit up the area like daylight. And moments later, several midget-sized beings in uniforms exited and began to wander around the craft. They never went more than 150 feet away from it, but they seemed to show an interest in the cows in this field. Now, the next day, the witness did read an article in the newspaper about animal mutilations, and he wondered if maybe that's why this UFO landed there, though he didn't report seeing anything like this. These ETs just seemed to show an interest in the cows, so he wondered about it, but certainly an interesting case. And here's another one. This one occurred on February 6, 1970. It's an undeniable UFO, which was seen by Mr. F. E. Burkhart and his wife. It was 8.25 p.m., and they saw this object, which was located in the section of the sky near the constellation Orion. And they watched as it made a long, slow curve across the sky, then stopped in place, flared bright yellow, then rose steeply, and proceeded to release four additional objects before climbing up higher, flaring up again, and then disappearing. They watched this for a good amount of time, about five minutes, using binoculars. 
They were so impressed that they called McClellan Air Force Base, and this was when they learned that another witness had also just called the base to report apparently the same object. Many cases in Sacramento. Here's a brief one, which occurred on April 3, 1975, when a mother and daughter said that they saw a UFO over Sacramento. They were leaving the city, and it followed them all the way to their home in nearby Galt. Now, it remained over the city of Galt for about two and a half hours, and was observed by several other residents in Galt. Here's another case which got a lot of attention because there was a bunch of witnesses. This occurred on November 3, 1981, when people over a wide area of Sacramento observed UFOs. One witness, Tim Blanchard, said it was around 2.20 p.m. when he saw, quote, an extremely bright and shiny object about 1,800 to 2,000 feet. This was in the northwest sky, and as he says, it was strange. I never saw anything like it before. It shook me up. Now another couple from East Sacramento said that they observed an object that looked oval and translucent. Here's a pretty recent case involving an apparent UFO fleet. This occurred on May 7, 2010, and comes from Kay Piper, who reported his North Sacramento area sighting to the National Examiner. And as he writes... I saw 12 to 15 shiny objects in the sky. The group of objects moved slowly north by northwest. I watched them travel for about a minute, and then all but one of the objects vanished instantly. The one remaining object moved back in a south by southwest direction directly over my head. Now he watched this object hover over his head for about two minutes when it was joined by another object, both of which then disappeared. He called his sighting, quote, epic. Now, the most recent sighting I found is quite impressive. And this comes from a witness uh, who says it was about a half hour after midnight on February 21st, 2018. And he decided to go to the local Jack in the Box for a late night snack. And this is when he saw an object appear out of thin air and hover over a building about 300 feet away. He reported it to MUFON. He actually drew the object, which you can see here. And as he says, I didn't have time to think. I was almost dumbfounded at what I was looking at. It had two blue lights that were parallel to each other. The blue light followed from the front of the craft to the back and were on the sides of it. They were bright. And I saw this craft the second it appeared. Before I could process what was happening, it shot off in a strange light and disappeared. This case was researched by Valerie Benko, a MUFON field investigator, who said, and I quote, The witness was very shaken up over this experience. He explained that they teach you in school this stuff is not real. If you talk about UFOs, people will label you as crazy. Unfortunately true. So that's Sacramento. And as you can see, it has the full range of close encounters, pretty much. From close encounters of the first kind, sightings, second, affecting the environment, third, humanoids being seen, and so forth. Really fascinating stuff. And that one encounter with the newspaper boy, <laughs> wow, never heard anything quite like that. I wonder about it. Certainly is fascinating. And now we move to our next and final location in this episode, which is by special request of Coconut. This is for you, Coconut, and you requested that I take a look at Nova Scotia, Canada. Again, this is not just a city. This is a fairly large area, encompassing, including several cities. So, again, by no means comprehensive. Some really famous cases there. Of course, the Shag Harbor USO case is probably the most famous. I'm just going to cover that sort of... Not too much in depth because it's been covered very extensively by other folks who are much more knowledgeable about it than I am. But I did find some really cool cases and I think you'll find it quite illuminating. I certainly hope so. There are plenty of interesting cases from Nova Scotia. 
One of the earliest I found occurred on August 4, 1950, when the crew of the ship Markala were off the coast of Walton, Nova Scotia, when an object appeared off the starboard bow. It was traveling about 50 to 100 feet above the water, very low, and actually approached to within 1,000 feet of the boat, at which point it revealed itself to be a cylindrical-shaped object about 10 feet in diameter. It was totally silent, shiny aluminum in appearance, and was moving in this weird kind of churning motion, and finally accelerated off into the distance. It was a report which actually caught the attention of American intelligence officers who showed great interest in the event. A brief but I think important case from Halifax occurred at 8.32 a.m. on June 15, 1952, when an Army meteorological officer, a trained observer, says that he saw a 100-foot-wide silver disk moving at about 800 miles per hour and ascending from about 5 to 8,000 feet altitude to 11 or 12,000 feet in less than 5 seconds. This maneuver, of course, rules out this object being a balloon or any conventional craft that we would know of. Now here is a rare humanoid case. Uh, I found this in Albert Rosali's book, The Humanoids Among Us. This occurred one evening in December 1953 when Miss Orphy of Sherbrooke was in her home and it was the middle of the night when somebody knocked on the door. She asked who it was, but the only response was some harder knocks on the door. At this point, her dog jumped up, went to the door to investigate, but quickly retreated and sat in the corner of the room, terrified and trembling. That was odd. Needless to say, Miss Orphy was afraid to answer the door, but she did go to her second-story window and looked out at her porch, and this is when she saw two, quote, indescribable shadows moving away from the house. A short time later, she saw a big, round, blue-green glowing object take off from only about 300 feet away from her house. She did call the police, who investigated and found broken bushes in the area where she said she had seen the object take off. And they told her that it looked as if an object of enormous weight had landed there and crushed these bushes. A somewhat harrowing case involving a UFO at sea involved actually two separate boats who encountered a UFO near Seal Island in May of 1963. The first witness was Captain Woodrow Atwood of the fishing boat Which Way In, who said that they... He and his crew saw a small, glowing, yellow object off in the distance. Suddenly, this object became blood-red in appearance and quickly approached the boat to within 150 feet and was radiating a heat that was so intense that the captain could feel it right through the cabin windows. One of the crewmen said that the heat was so intense he thought it might cause the boat to burst into flames. Quite frightening. The object hovered overhead for about five minutes, then moved off. Captain Atwood immediately made a radio announcement to any nearby vessels, alerting them to the object, and he got a response. He got a call from the captain of the boat, Racer, who said that he and his crew saw a, quote, large red ball of light, which passed so low over their boat that it narrowly missed striking the mast. Two years later, in 1965, Two young boys, Kevin Davis and Gary Jardine of Spring Hill, reported their observation of a red dome-shaped craft complete with portholes. As they watched it, a weird bar-like instrument or device came out of the largest porthole, re-entered a second time and emerged again. Then smoke and sparks came out and as the craft ascended, Snow in the area on the ground was blown around and bushes were actually flattened. Nova Scotia's most famous incident by far really put Nova Scotia on the map. This occurred on October 4, 1967. And this is when numerous witnesses at Shag Harbor saw an object descend into the harbor and slowly sink beneath the waves. This is an incredibly long and complicated event. In fact, there's an entire book written on this case by Chris Stiles and Don Ledger detailing this days-long UFO encounter. I mean, it went on for almost a week. 
as military's search for this object. It's incredibly well documented. There are government documents verifying that this incident did take place. A lot of witnesses. It's exceedingly strange and far too long to present here. Also, Ledger and Stiles have covered it extensively. So I would refer anyone interested in this event to check out their incredible research into this undeniable USO case. Probably one of the most famous USO cases in the world, certainly in Canadian history. Here's a brief UFO landing case which was reported to the newspapers. It's quite interesting though. The witness is Percy McBride of Keenan, Nova Scotia, who says that at 2 a.m. on November 29, 1967, he was camping next to a lake when he saw a, quote, strange looking object. It came from the eastern sky, passed by him, came back and landed on a forested hill nearby. He was close enough to hear it making a strange kind of warbling sound. And he said it was flashing all sorts of colored lights. The actual structure of the craft was white. He was very curious. He got up, he approached it to within a quarter mile. He estimates that it was about as big as a car, not huge. But once he got close to it, he shouted out to it, Who are you? There was no answer, so he repeated his question, at which point the object promptly took off with a loud howling noise. This frightened him. He was afraid it might return, so he went back to his camping spot and put out the campfire. Here's another interesting USO account from Nova Scotia, which occurred on September 1st, 1968, at around 4.30 p.m. There were four witnesses, all young boys, David Taylor, age 14, his friend David Smith, age 15, Gregory Cavanaugh, 12, and Peter Blakeney, age 11. They were on the Cornwallis River dike when they saw this sort of black disc-shaped object hovering very low, about 100 feet, right above the river. They ran up to it. I mean, they're only a few feet away from it, although, I mean, it is 100 feet up over the river. So they could now see that this was 15 feet in diameter, about 6 feet thick, and they watched this thing hover right over the river for about 10 minutes. They said it was oscillating in the air, spinning like a top, it made no sound whatsoever, and after 10 minutes dropped down into the river without even a splash, and just moved off with the speed of the current. A very odd and interesting multi-witness case. Moving along, the next case occurred two years later, October 5, 1970, when 16-year-old Paul Scott was just walking to school in Truro, and this is when he saw an orange, yellow, and green object. He says it was the size of a small house, flying overhead and emitting a whining sound and what looked like white smoke. It terrified the horses in a nearby field. His mother saw it too. Now this did get some attention and NASA officials reportedly heard about it and said it was just a cloud of barium gas. But this is contradicted by the Canadian Armed Forces radar base at Shearwater who said that they made contact with a quote, solid, stationary, unidentified object. This was around the same time, early in the morning. This next case comes from researcher Don Ledger. He's covered this area quite well, a good researcher. This is an interesting animal reaction case. It was 6.15 p.m. on November 8, 1973, as Joan Schofield, her husband, and their four children observed two glowing red lights flying at treetop level, slowing down, speeding up, and circling around the area. In fact, these objects were in view for a full 15 minutes, and during this whole time, the family dog exhibited, quote, great agitation. Another interesting animal reaction case occurred two months later, on January 6, 1974. Of course, this is Nova Scotia. It was 11.30 p.m. when Carl Nicholson was babysitting, and he heard his dog barking outside. Looking outside, he saw an object with blue, yellow, green, and red lights all in a row, hovering and then apparently landing behind some trees. He watched this for about an hour and was impressed enough to call the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And they showed interest in his case. He was interviewed by an officer who apparently took the report very seriously. Less than a year later, 
July 16, 1974, Ernest Bugley and his wife and two others saw four very bright objects hovering and darting over the Amherst marshes. One of the objects remained high in the sky, while three others, which were blue in color, they spun around and swirled around towards the ground and would dart back up, maneuvering like this for over an hour before disappearing. Now here's a more recent case, July of 1996. A pilot and police officer, a good witness, was flying with his father-in-law and son at about 3,500 feet elevation from Waterville to Prince Edward Island. They were over the Cape Blomidon area when they saw a 60-foot wide chrome-like metallic sphere which was pacing their aircraft about 2 miles away and 500 feet lower in elevation, about 3,000 feet. Now, this is when the pilot decided to bank his plane, a Piper Cherokee, to get a better look at this object. At this point, the object immediately darted away to a distance of about 20 miles, now appearing only as a bright dot, at which point it disappeared. But this really impressed the pilot, because as he says, I got a sick feeling when I saw the thing. I knew right then that this was not natural or man-made. He said it gave him more fear than he's ever felt while dealing with some pretty violent disputes as a police officer. Now the final case in this little compilation is quite a bizarre case of a UFO over a graveyard. I actually did a whole episode on UFOs over graveyards. I covered this one briefly, but I think it bears repeating. This was investigated by Eugene Frizan and involves a 16-year-old paper boy by the name of Jeff. This was at Glace Bay, and he was going by the Greenwood Cemetery on Dominion Street around 6 a.m. on January 24, 2000. This is when he suddenly heard a whining sound and saw this dark, kind of triangular shaped object moving overhead. This is a quite small object. It was very close, only a few feet away. He said it couldn't have been more than nine feet high, five feet long, and it was moving just above the ground, kind of following the contour of the ground. He said it made a few turns. It was very low, as low as the tombstones themselves. This whole sighting was very brief, maybe about 5 to 10 seconds. But the witness became quite frightened and he fled the area. And as he did, he heard these strange scuffling sounds behind him as though someone or something was following him. And that was pretty much the end of the sighting, but there were some weird after effects. His watch alarm, which had been set for 5.40 a.m., went off at 6.30 a.m., he does not know how that happened. Also, within hours of the sighting, he says small, red, raised, and painful blisters appeared on his forehead, cheek, and chest. These were verified by his family. And another thing, he apparently may have had missing time because he noticed that he was 45 minutes late finishing his route, which didn't make any sense given the brevity of his sighting. Another strange thing that he thought might be connected was that just prior to this event he had a week-long series of unusual nightmares of his home's roof being ripped off by the wind. Hard to say whether that's connected or not, but he thought it was worth mentioning. Also perhaps connected or important is not far from this area is a reserve coal mine and the Glace Bay plant which actually produced heavy water for atomic plants. The investigator, Eugene Frizan, lives near this area, and he also reports several sightings of his own in this same area over the past few years. So there you go. That's Nova Scotia, Canada. How interesting are these cases? Humanoids, landings, a UFO in a graveyard. That was a really compelling case. Of course, the very famous Shag Harbor incident. Wow, amazing could do an entire episode on just that case alone. So thanks very much for referring that case, Coconut, uh, or that location. I hope you found it interesting. But that's it for today. Again, if you guys want me to cover your hometown, send it my way. I'll do my best. You'll have to be patient because there's a long list of locations to cover. 
And again, please limit yourself to one specific city or something along those lines because I just can't. I can't do a, an entire country. Uh, it's just too much work. I mean, honestly, each location on Earth you could probably write an entire book on. But I'm going to do my best. I find this super interesting. I always learn something. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It's amazing to me that not only are UFOs being seen everywhere, but they're landing and humanoids are there and people are being taken on board and there's the entire range of evidence. Just goes to show we have a lot still to learn about what's going on here. So that's our episode for today. Once again, thank you guys. I always appreciate you watching. I appreciate the comments you put in. Uh, helping me to always make this a better podcast and improve the content and my presentation and so forth. So yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. I truly appreciate you guys. And until next time, keep asking those hard questions, keep searching for the truth, and most important of all, keep having fun, and I will see you next Friday.